Welcome to the Move to Value podcast, powered by Chess Health Solutions. The Move to Value podcast is dedicated to helping healthcare providers understand and make the transition into value-based care. We do this through conversations and the sharing of innovative ideas with experts and leaders throughout the healthcare industry. Our mission is to sustainably transform the healthcare experience for the patient, provider, and care team by cultivating a value-oriented, compassionate, and health-aligned community. In this episode, we continue our conversation with Jennifer Houlihan, Vice President of Value-Based Care and Population Health for Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist, about the need for value-based care in rural population health. Jennifer, what are some of the rural-focused, value-based strategies that you're currently employing? Yeah, that that has actually been a focus for us many years. So working with CHESS, uh, evolving our Medicare Shared Savings, Medicare Advantage, scaling that now to our Medicaid population, we have been building what I would say is a foundation of value-based capabilities that Almost from day one, we also scaled immediately in our rural communities. So some of those include uh, working closely with our providers um, and a, to promote annual wellness visits. And that's such an important piece of the work that we do to close care gaps, address those social drivers of health, and really proactively identify the patients that we need to care manage. So working with our rural providers to build out a process that works well for their clinics um, and making sure the patients through those uh, e-consults, virtual visits, and proactively scheduling them in are able to get to their medical home in a timely uh, manner to do that. So that that's something we've really focused on with our rural providers, and that's where some of the wraparound transportation and other services come into play. Um, access is such a critical piece um, of that. Transitions of care would be another one. We have put RN resources in the ED Uh, We work very closely with our hospitalist program, um, and part of that is development of the hospitalist-to-home program, so that that allows patients to maybe be discharged early uh, home, but putting in additional supports with our care management team, our community health worker team, social work, as well as some remote patient monitoring to help them be successful and and hopefully not get readmitted, Uh, and then other supports that kind of play more of a behind the scenes role include some of our robust analytics. So doing some risk stratification work, which again, just really helps us understand the population from um, who has high social needs, where is their polypharmacy, uh, do we have patients who have multiple chronic conditions, allowing us to understand who's seen their primary care provider who needs to be scheduled in and create a more proactive approach. And I do think that's very important in rural Um, Because, again, we might have more scarcity of resources. So really trying to be proactive um, and and sort of leverage some of these other access uh, ways to to provide a medical home support becomes even more key. And the analytics also allows us to um, know our patients, know all of the care gaps that we need to address, but then also evaluate um, whether what we're doing is working and sort of shift that around. And so knowing where we may have provider gaps, working with um, our family medicine, internal medicine departments, making sure we can scale resources where we can from that perspective also is, is something we've worked on. Jennifer, is it sometimes difficult to think in entire population segments concerning outcomes? You're looking at vast groups. Do you find that to be a challenge in terms of moving the needle in public health? In our region, we have about 250,000 unique patients, and it is a lot of data. Uh, We're getting data from the EMR on multiple clinical clinical indicators with our payer partners. We're collecting now social driver information. Uh, I think that's where having such a strong analytics platform is so important. Um, risk segmentation becomes really important. So if we know patients are well, they're seeing their physician every year, they're taking their medications, they're controlled within their chronic disease, then there's a pathway for that. But if there are patients that we know are at risk for a readmission or are not adherent to their medication um, and, and seem to not be managing well, then that's where we think about our, our ambulatory care management 
and then deploying some of the other uh, resources, like, again, a community health worker, which has been incredibly helpful, uh, especially when we need to make visits to patients' home. But I think that's really where segmentation comes into play, uh, because you're right, otherwise it becomes very overwhelming. But then it is sort of having a level of sophistication where you can sort of say, we've arrayed the population, we understand the risk segments, we know which uh, pro provider groups they're working with who may not be working or seeing a provider that we need to get them in with, but then deploying this whole array of pharmacy, care management teams, uh, maybe our community partner teams to sort of hopefully engage with patients at the right time at the right place, because otherwise you're right, it it's sort of how do you get your hands around this? And I have found it's usually not about one disease condition. It's really looking at more of that whole population. You know, we say we want to do everything for everyone all the time. And we, I think we, I think we want to do everything for people at the right time when they need it. And, and I think being proactive is usually what I think sets apart. Like how is pop health different? Because we're using this information to really be proactive and reach out and not wait for somebody who's not managing because we have things like the frailty index and other risk scores. So our goal is to also try to sort of anticipate what might happen and intervene before it happens. Well, how can healthcare leverage community-based organizations to improve those outcomes? Yeah, I think that's a, a double-edged question because I think we often need to be engaging our health care organizations more intentionally about asking them what they need. Um, I think thinking about what does it mean? You certainly we have the data, but what does it mean to improve health in this community? What would that look like? Um, what, what, what would tell you, what outcomes would tell you that we were improving health? So I think our community partners are incredibly important. And if we think about, you know, what's driving someone's health, I think 20% of a patient's overall health is what's derived from the medical services that are rendered to them. So the rest of that is social and physical environment, behavioral, um, and a little bit of genetics, but really that kind of behavioral, social, emotional health, and then the physical environment is so key to that. Uh, and we can't solve all of a health care issues that are so broad-based alone. Um, so they are an incredibly important partner. I think it's everything from thinking about uh, what we make investments in. Um, and sometimes they may not be directly health care related. They might be supporting a new housing development like we've 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 done here in Winston um, it might be we're promoting the opening of a federally qualified health center which we have in, and um, supported through our Wilkes Foundation uh, which means we're opening up another primary care access point for the community um, it also might be investing of course with our local food bank partners investing in school-based programs um, and then other partners that may uh, focused certainly on social um, substance abuse and behavioral health, uh, really helping support our partners there because we also know we don't have the capacity or the workforce to also provide all of that care. So it, they having that as whether it's part of a foundation, local community board, um, having our teams be present and in, in, in their uh, meetings or on their boards. But I, I think it is sort of rethinking what community investments mean, um, and then using things like the CHNA needs assessment as a guideline of really determining this is what the health of a community, this is what it's saying is the, the highest and prioritized needs and making sure we're aligning with that. As we're making investments in the community through food banks or school-based initiatives, are we able to quantify that investment to see the impact to the overall health of the population we're investing in? That's a good question. I think some, you know, when we look at some of the indicator data, the American Community Survey, CDC data, I would say yes, but it's not always immediate. It sometimes can take two, three, five years to see an impact. Uh, and some of the challenges are so large and systemic 
it could take decades. So that I think is always the balance of what are we making investments in and what is the return? Is it we're uh, managing diabetes and we can show that we lowered A1C for 500 patients or is it we're working on childhood obesity and it's going to take decades before we see the rate of child obesity go down in a community. So that's, so the answer is yes. But I also think that it, it sort of depends on the scope and scale, but also, you know, maybe defining early indicators, knowing that some of those longer term outcomes may take much longer. And I think that's a challenge for health systems, for funders in general, because we typically like to see those wins pretty quickly. We want to see results. Um, and some of these challenges are deep, have been been in place for a very long time, um, and, and, and will take a very long time before we can see real movement in that. But I think there are um, what I'd say leading indicators that, yes, we would definitely be looking for that. Well, Jennifer, one final question. What can a provider do right now to begin to address some of the needs of their rural patient population? Hmm, that's, that is a good question. I think providers probably know, they're, you know, they're seeing patients and families. They probably know across their practice what, what they're seeing, whether maybe it's, maybe it's something that's more straightforward, like uh, I have a lot of missed appointments, and I need more support for transportation. I think connecting in, um, our goal, I think, for all of our practices, including rural, is to have a care team connected to them, whether that's an RN, navigator, social worker, community health worker. So making sure they're tapping into that, and, and if there are resources that they're not aware of, taking advantage of that, but at the same time, also um, sharing, being part of some of these more community social impact committees of helping prioritize where we're, we're resourcing um, and making investments to support that. So I think that, you know, having a primary care medical home, um, uh, you know, is such an important piece of what we're trying to do in general in pop health, that really um, being able to work with that team and take advantage of some of the things like we're doing with our Find Help Resource Hub, um, again, engaging with that care team, and then also telling us um, as pop health leaders, we need more of X because this is actually what's really, these are the barriers for our patient to actually achieving optimal health um, is what I would say as well. Well, Jennifer Houlihan, thank you for that insight. And thank you for joining us today on the Move to Value podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Move to Value podcast powered by Chess Health Solutions where our mission is to sustainably transform the healthcare experience for the patient, provider, and care team. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. As always, you can head over to movetovaluepodcast.com to sign up for the email list, as well as check out all the resources in the show notes. If you are interested in continuing to hear about value-based care and how it impacts you, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. Also, we would love it if you would share the Move to Value podcast across social media and leave a rating and review. See you next time.